Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thought it's time that we get back to the Salvation for Lost Sinners series. So we're going to be talking about prayer. We're going to be turning to some of the scriptures in the King James Bible. Make sure you have your King James Bible out. And we're going to just be going over, there's a lot here. It's probably going to be an hour-long study. They're worth it, especially when they're in depth. So let's get started. Okay. If you want to turn to Romans 10.6 in your King James Bibles. There's a reason I'm starting at verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? So what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith which we preach. And it talks about the heart. Because people are always ask, and when we do prayer, there's two parts to prayer that we're going to be talking about for salvation for lost sinners. Okay. Verse 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right. Two parts to prayer that we're going to be talking about. Confession. And call upon the name of the Lord, asking God to save you. Now, if you're new to this series, I'd go back and watch the first series. We talked started. We talked about what's God saving you from? Okay, hell, All right? From yourself and hell, sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We did a study on repentance. What's true biblical repentance? Why is it so important to have the right repentance? What's the key in repentance? Brothers and sisters in Christ, the key in repentance is sorrow. Just admitting you're a sinner isn't true biblical repentance. You have to have sorrow in your heart, in your heart, for sinning against God. We talked about how when we got to the belief, part three, belief. If you didn't repent, you're not capable of believing in Jesus Christ. So what part are we on now? We're on the part where you confess and then you ask God to save you. So that's the parts we're talking about right now. So, confess, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, to own, avow, or acknowledge publicly, to declare belief in or adherence to. Okay, So you can confess one-on-one -on -one with somebody, or you can confess publicly in a group of people. You're going to confess one-on-one -on -one between you and Jesus Christ, okay? between you and the Lord. And we're gonna, we just read that there. So, and then call in a general sense to drive, to strain or force out sound, hence to speak for, to ask, to request. There's a lot of people that attack that. Well, call doesn't mean ask. Yes, it does. Okay. So, we're going to go through here and we're going to talk about this. So, Jeremiah 21, 29, 12. If you want to turn to Jeremiah 29, 12. This one's a good one to turn to. Old Testament. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Let that verse sink in. It's a great verse to get us in the next subject, the next subject we're going to be talking about is God knows the heart. When you're going to confess, confession comes from the heart. Okay, repentance comes from the heart. Belief comes from is in the heart. Both of them happen in the heart. And as we're going to see here, who sees the heart? Okay, confession comes from the heart. So God knows the heart. Okay, Jeremiah 17:9. We're already close, so oops, I closed it. Jeremiah 17:9. We were close. <laughs> Jeremiah 17, 9. My slow turning. Okay. The heart 
is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, if you want to turn to Matthew 9, chapter 9, verse 4, remember, you can always pause the video and then turn. I'm going to be like moving through these scriptures, brothers and sisters Christ. Matthew 9, 4, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God does. You know how God shows us He knows it? Uh, Hebrews 4, 12, if you want to turn to Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This, the reason a lot of people hate the King James Bible, and they'll try to say, oh, it's a nice Bible, but I prefer one of the new Catholic Bibles, the new perversions. The reason they hate this Bible is because it knows your heart. Jesus sees your heart and he shows it to you through this word of God. Shows us our heart through this word of God. Amen. Now Luke 6.45. Luke 6.45. We can turn to some of these. Luke 6.45. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. When you confess, it comes from the heart. True confession. There's people that can say something and it'll be a fact. They're not really confessing it, they're just stating a fact. Sometimes people can be reading something off. Are they confessing? No. Why? Because it's got to come from the heart to be a true confession. If someone gets caught, what they call red-handed, in the middle of stealing something, oh, I confess I stole it. They got caught. Now the question is, if they didn't get caught, would they have come forward and confessed that they did something wrong? See, confession comes from the heart. Okay. As we're going to read here, there's a lot of things that people can read the Bible Someone can come to you and read the Bible, and it sounds like they're confessing, but they're not. Okay? It's got to come from the heart. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay? Um, you can have a perfect heart before the Lord. The Bible talks about it. Um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished into all good works. What is that talking about? A pure heart. Your heart can be right with the Lord. You're still a sinner. I'm a saved sinner. I still fail the Lord. I fall flat on my face. And I have to ask the Lord to have mercy on me. A sinner. Okay? But your heart can be right with the Lord. Best example is go read about King David. He was a man after God's own heart. His heart was perfect before the Lord. But look at the sins that he committed. Okay? You can have a pure heart. Right? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's a heart condition. It's a, like they say, a heart condition. Now, 2 Corinthians 4 3. 2 Corinthians 4 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Right? Why is it hid? Because they're not pure in heart. They don't really want Jesus Christ. People who take confession out of the plan of salvation, they don't, pardon me, they don't want to see Jesus Christ. Okay, they shall see God. They don't want Jesus Christ. That's why they can't see the gospel. If the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we preach the gospel a lot to people and they don't want it. Especially to people professing Christians. I was a false convert for most of my life. Remember, these studies are to help brothers and sisters in Christ out and I'm trying to reach those who profess to be saved, to let them know this is necessary for salvation. Okay? It's a heart condition. It's a heart issue. God looks at the heart. Timothy 2.22 
Okay? Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let that one sink in. Remember we, we read back there, you're to call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. You're supposed to call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hmm. Okay. At the point of salvation, it is a heart issue. Okay. And we just talked about it. Uh, belief or repentance leads to true belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ happening in the heart, a pure heart. And when you've done both those in your heart, we're going to find out you can still pray in your heart. We'll get to that. Um, but you're to pray. Okay? You're to confess both in prayer. Why do I say you confess both? I had a brother in Christ ask me, why do you say confess your repentance? Now, if you follow along in these studies, when you repent, it leads to true belief. When you go to confess your belief, repentance is part of it. Okay? You believe that you are a sinner on your way to hell. You deserve to go to hell. Lord, I'm so sorry for sinning against you. I understand now that you died for my sins. Your death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, we're going to get into a little bit more detail. You know what I'm saying? It goes hand in hand. Okay. Remember it said the uh, word that we preach, the faith? Let's see up here. It says, because I started back a ways. Let's see. The word is nigh thee, even thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we pe preach. The word of faith. Okay. Through faith. We talked about that in a lot of other studies that I've done, brothers and sisters in Christ, and if you're new to this video, okay? Ephesians 2, 8, when it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. What is the through faith? The faith that we preach. The word of faith that we preach. We'll talk about it. But right now, some of the attacks on... Um, Prayer is that prayer is a work. Okay? And one of the things that they attack prayer is they always say, well, what about somebody who can't speak, who's mute? Okay? So can someone pray without speaking out loud, voice sound actually coming out of their mouth? If you want to turn to Genesis 24, let's go to Genesis 24. I found this one was pretty interesting. Genesis 24, 42. If you don't know what the, this is, is Abraham's son Isaac. He doesn't want him taking a wife from one of the local people. He wants it from his own people, his own kindred. So he sends a servant back to find a wife. And this is what he's saying. And I came this day unto this unto the well and said, O Lord my God, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of pitcher to drink, and she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. That the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in mine heart. What did it say up there? It said, I came to stand the well. Um, behold, I stand at the well of water, and it shall come to pass. Oh gosh, where is it? Where did we start this? 42. And said, I'm sorry, it was right there in front of me. Verse 42, and I said this day unto the well, and said, and said, people say, well, he's talking out loud. Right here it just said, before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her picture, pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down into the well and drew water, and I said unto her, let me drink, I pray thee. Right there is evidence of somebody who's talking to the Lord in their heart. Right? They're not talking out loud, but they're still praying. Now, turn to 1 Samuel 1.8. This is the one a lot of us knew. I've talked about this before, but I'd like to go over it again. Okay. 1 Samuel 1.8.
No, it stopped at eight. That's one eight. First Samuel one eight. Okay. Then said Elkanah, oh gosh, Elkanah, I butcher that ver word. Her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the, the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She's praying. And she vowed a vow and said, there we see the word said again, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the afflictions of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. When you're confessing to the Lord, they always try to say, what if someone can't talk? Anything to keep you from getting saved. If you're a professing Christian like I was most of my life, you can't take confessing your repentance and your belief out. You can't take asking God to save you out, okay? Don't let them deceive you. Okay? God can hear the prayer. Oh, sorry. You can pray in your heart to God one-on-one. -on -one, okay? And eventually, I understand if you can't talk, you can't talk. But I'm saying after salvation... Eventually, it's going to come out, and you're going to confess it before everybody, just like I did, just like a lot of you brothers and sisters in Christ did. Right? Can you pray without words actually coming out of your mouth, like as far as sound? Absolutely, you can pray in your heart. Once again, it comes down to the heart. God looks at your heart. You can say something and try to disguise and deceive people what's in your heart. But eventually, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Eventually, it's going to, tr truth is going to come out. Right. Can God hear the prayers of a lost person? I've had some people ask this before. Um, Psalm 66, 16. Right. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me, he hath attended to my voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. If I hold iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What happens when you come to God broken, you repent, you believe, and now it comes time for prayer, confession, and asking God to save you? What happens? You're coming before the foot of the cross, and you're throwing your iniquities at the foot of the cross. You're no longer holding them in your heart. You did that all your years before you got saved. You held iniquity in your heart. I held iniquity in my heart. But what changed? You threw your iniquities at the foot of the cross. Okay. Um, I did a video, Why God Will Not Listen to Certain Prayers. I'll link it in the description box. if I, I'm going to try to remember to. Um, you can look it up and do a YouTube search under my channel too. Okay. Can God hear the prayers of a lost person? Well, if he's coming to them to, for salvation, absolutely. They'll try to tell you God can't hear the prayers of the lost. When you come to salvation, you throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross, he can hear you. Right? He heard me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, he heard you. Anybody that attacks that, he didn't hear you because you're holding iniquity in your heart. I've heard that said by false converts trying to be in ministry on YouTube. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and it just never worked. Then I realized it was only belief. Why is that? They're holding iniquity in their heart. They don't want the real Jesus Christ also. But I don't want to go off on a tangent, okay? Let's get into confessing. Romans 10.8, when we read there, it said, The word of faith which we preach, okay, that's what they're talking about confessing. That's what you're confessing. The word of faith which we preach. So Acts 20, 21. 
Go back to the New Testament. Acts 20, 21. Testify both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of faith that we preach. That's what they preach. Now people say that's the book of Acts. It's a transition book. Okay, we'll turn to 2 Corinthians 7, 9. I, only, I do that side because people like to attack the true gospel. And I know, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to deal with those people. If you're one of those people, I pray you come broken to the true gospel and stop fighting the true gospel. All right. 2 Corinthians 7, chapter 7, verse 9. It is 2 Corinthians. Once again, I'm in first. Now, now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance to repentance. Sorrow is part of what leads to true biblical repentance. Remember, not that you were just made sorry. What does that mean? Um, someone can be sorry for the consequences, but they're not actually sorry for the action. If they, if they didn't get caught, they wouldn't be sorry. So not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. It leads to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Okay? The word of faith which we preach. Ephesians 2, verse 8, what we talked about. For by grace are you saved through faith. You have to go through the faith that it takes to repent. The word of faith says it right here. In order to get to salvation, you got to go through repentance. That's what you're confessing. Okay. Second Corinthians 7, 9. We just read that one. Sorry. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Okay. 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye, have, ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. People don't like to read one and two. How can you believe in vain? It's not a heart. You don't have a pure heart. It's not coming from the heart. Okay. You skip repentance. It's never your belief isn't going to be in your heart. So it's going to, your belief is going to be in vain because you're believing in a Jesus Christ, not the Jesus Christ. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we go along, how he died, uh, he was nailed to a cross. Okay. His blood that was shed was God's blood. This God, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Not only son, only begotten son. Born of derived from okay. God manifest in the flesh okay. that's the word of faith which we preach now Romans 10 9 that we we're talking about that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus back up there the faith which we preached repentance leads to the cross it leads to Jesus Christ Okay. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, that, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto right, or righteousness, but with, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It starts in the heart, and it's going to come out here. That's just the way it is, because God's word says it is. Romans 8.1, what's this thing? When you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, you're confessing your repentance and your belief who Jesus is. And I want to touch on something here real quick. When it says, God hath raised him from the dead. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, 
but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The law of sin and death. And who overcame it? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.54 If you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians 15.54 so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The, death, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of, the, of sin is the law. Remember, we just talked about the law of sin and death. But thanks be to God, who giveth us victory, through our capital L Lord Jesus Christ. Why is the resurrection so important? Because the Jesus that you confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, is God fully and completely. When I first got saved, brothers and sisters in Christ, and those professing Christians out there, or you're even new, when I first got saved, I understood that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He's the Son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. It's God's blood that was shed on Calvary. And only God's blood could wash my sins away. I had to come to Him broken as a broken sinner. After salvation, you're going to learn more. God's going to show you more about what it means for Jesus to be God fully and completely. Okay, You might not understand everything, but you understand that Jesus is God fully and completely. Okay? If you believe that, well, he's, he's kind of like God, or he might be like God, or he's a lesser God, that's not the same Jesus. And the only reason I'm bringing this up real quick is I want to talk, because some people attack us who believe in the Godhead. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it has to do with when we confess the real Lord Jesus Christ. They say we, we deny that Jesus is the Son of God. No, we do not. 1 Corinthians 12.3 1 Corinthians 12.3. Let's turn to these. 12, verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit, capital S, Spirit of God, calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the, capital L, Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Amen. You get saved, you understand that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And why were you able to say He's the Lord? Because at salvation, that's the Jesus Christ you professed. That's the Jesus Christ you believed in. God saved you. You can say Jesus is the, capital L, Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay. Jesus is the, capital L, Lord. There's a lot of people say, well, I believe that. They'll take the out and just say Jesus is Lord. No, it's Jesus is the Lord, singular, the capital L Lord. He's Lord of Lords. Capital L Lord of lowercase l Lords. And a lot of people will say, well, I believe Jesus is the Lord, but they make it a lowercase l Lord. And they don't believe he's the singular. Right? You've got to be careful with that. When you get saved, what Jesus are you conf professing? You're confessing and uh, professing to believe in. Right? 1 John 4.15 Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Absolutely. Jesus is the Son of God. God manifests in the flesh. Remember we talked about came in the likeness of sinful flesh? And for sin condemned sin in the flesh? He was perfect. He is God. He's the Son of God, and He's also God fully, completely. And we can go all the way into that all we want about the Godhead. Great is the mystery of godliness. Well, how does that work? How... It's a mystery. Now, begot, I looked it up. Um, uh, procreated, generated. We say born of, derived from. Okay. Uh, we talk about likeness of, of uh, sinful flesh, God manifests in the flesh. 
John 2.16 goes on to say, Light has come into the world. Remember we said three, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Then it goes on to say, Light has come into the world. God has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. Right? When you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you believe that He is God. Right? It was God's blood that was shed on Calvary, Acts 20, 29. Um, Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It was God's blood that was shed on Calvary. We do not deny that Jesus is the Son of God. We just don't deny his deity. He's fully and completely God. A lot of people out there do. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the capital S Spirit of God. Someone has the Holy Spirit. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist where ye have heard that it is come and even now is already in the world. When you say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, like I said, when I first got saved, I didn't know about this. But I said Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is the capital L Lord. He is God. What was I saying? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. You learn this. Is come in the flesh is something you can say about an eternal being and only an eternal being, God. Right. Now, there's three things you can confess with the Holy Spirit that proves that the Holy Spirit came in. Right. Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Son of God, is come in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the Lord. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. When you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that it was God's blood that was shed on the cross, what are you doing? Okay. That he died for, the, for your sins and rose again the third day, that only God's blood can wash your sins away. What are you doing? You're confessing that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You're confessing that the, Jesus is the Son of God. That he is come, is come in the flesh. He is God fully and completely. And I had to throw that in there real quick. Because people say we deny that we who believe in the true gospel of repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, call upon the name of the Lord to save you. We believe in the real Jesus Christ of the Godhead. They say we deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We do not deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We profess that he's God fully and completely. God manifest in the flesh, born of, derived from, Son of God. All right. So I wanted to throw that in there. So remember, confessing, you're confessing the words of faith which we preach. And you're confessing the capital L Lord Jesus Christ. You're confessing your repentance because your repentance is what leads you to Jesus Christ the real Jesus Christ that died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. Take on that debt. Right. So we've got our uh, confessing. It's required. There's no way to get out from under it. Okay, let's get into calling. You know, the calling is asking. Another thing that they'll attack, brothers and sisters of Christ, is that calling is an asking. Okay. And if you're a false convert out there, a professing Christian, and you've been told you don't have to ask God to save you, then God didn't save you. Okay. Let's get into this. Genesis 4.26 And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. That's when it's the first time you see call upon the name of the Lord. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, you read through the whole Old Testament. People are asking God to save them. Lord, save us from these Philistines. Lord, save us from these people. Lord, help us here. Lord, bless us here. Lord, please forgive us for this. They're asking God things. They're called upon the name of the Lord. It's all throughout the Old Testament. And yet people will still attack it saying, call doesn't mean ask. Um, they're ripping their garments and putting on sackcloth, ash on their heads. And they're calling out to God. Call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Matthew 4, 18. Okay. Uh -huh. 
And Jesus walked. Matthew 4, 18. Let's go there. To 22. And Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee and saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Now, is he commanding them? You follow me right now. Is he brainwashing them or controlling them, forcing them to do it? Let's see. Verse 20. And there straightway left their nets and followed him. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left their, the ship and their father and followed him. He called them. He asked them, hey, follow me. They could have said no. They could continue mending their fence. Jesus wasn't forcing them to do it. He's asking, hey, follow me. Come follow me. Question mark. Okay, they drop their nets and they go. Okay. And they try to say, oh, no, 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 no. Call doesn't mean ask. It just means believe. Okay. How does that work out there? It's like calling someone to dinner. You know, you're asking them to come down to, to eat. Matthew 21. This is a good one. Matthew 21. Not 21. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. And we're going to go a ways, but we're going to point out a few things that go on here. Matthew 21, or sorry, first chapter 20, verse 1. So quick and easy to say 21 when you see them side by side. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which went, went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. Now here's something that's very interesting, I realize. It said, and they went their way. They were idle in the marketplace, and it says, and they went their way. In other words, they didn't go. I believe it's saying they didn't go. All right? They went off and did their own thing, their way. All right? Verse 5, again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idly and saith unto them, Why stand ye there, stand here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Remember, we saw up there it said they went their own way. If he was commanding them, they wouldn't go their own way. He's asking saying, hey, I got work for you. Come work in my vineyard. They went their own way. Verse 8, So when they, so when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborer, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they... Likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, The last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Dost not thou agree with, the, with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. For many are called, but few chosen. You can go pause this video and read back through that story again. He went out there calling everybody. Hey, come. Hey, come. I got work. You need money? You need hire? I, I got work. Come. Some came, some didn't. 
Many are called, but few are chosen. Okay. He's asking. Call means ask. He wasn't commanding people to come to the, the vineyard to work. Second uh, Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? Many are called, but few are chosen. It's out there. You want to get saved? God will show you the truth. You want to know the truth? God will show it to you. Okay? Does everyone get saved? No. Everyone does not get saved. Why? Because we go out and they get preached, they love their sin. But people are preaching repentance and people don't want to hear it. People are preaching true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women are preaching the real Jesus Christ. And people don't want to hear it. We tell you that you have to confess both in prayer to show your heart. It's coming from your heart. People don't want to do it. We tell them you've got to ask God to save you. Why wouldn't you ask God to save you? People don't want to do it because they don't want to be saved. They love this world. They love their condition, their sin condition. You know, on their way to hell, but they get to live it up here. Okay. Call does mean ask. Now, what we're going to get into real quick, brothers and sisters in Christ. First, I'm going to say this. Repentance leads to belief. We've said this. Okay? And it happened, both happen in the heart. You can't truly be about repentance. And you confess both in, to the Lord in prayer, and it, that comes from the heart. It shows that the first two came from the heart. You're confessing to the Lord, and you ask God to save you. Now, we're going to talk about a few things. Why are people against this? If you're professing to be saved out there, and you don't want to confess, why are you against it? What does the Bible say? Okay. Reasons why people do not wish to confess. Number one, they are ashamed. Romans 10, 9, when we read up there, I'm rereading it again, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Why do people not want to confess? Because they're ashamed. Paul wrote in Romans 1.16. Go ahead and turn to Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Leads to salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why won't people confess? Because they're ashamed. They're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Romans 9.33 As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling block, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. When you won't confess, it's not only are you ashamed of confessing it, you're ashamed of, of, of believing it. It comes back down to the heart. You're, you're ashamed of saying it because you're ashamed of believing it. You're ashamed that you believed it or you're too ashamed to believe it. Mm -hmm. Now, two, the second reason. The fear and praise of men. First, the fear of men, and that you want the praise of men over, the pra over praising God. Okay. John 12, 42. Turn to John 12, 42. Yep. 42, Jesus is preaching, and he's talking, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him among the, among the chief rulers. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They had fear. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. But what else was there? For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. 
You get put out of the Babel building, praise the Lord. Why do people not want to believe the true gospel, stand for the true perfect written word of God and say, hey, that man behind the pulpit's a hireling. That man's not preaching truth. None of this is in scripture. Why do the people keep their mouth shut? They don't want to be put out of these Babel buildings, these so-called church buildings. Why? Because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. These people that just adamantly say confession is not part of salvation. Asking God's not part of salvation. We're going to get to that. The asking part. John 9. Um, John chapter 9 verse 18. Turn to John 9, 18. Here's another story. This is about the blind man that Jesus healed, and he's conf confronted by the Sadducees, scribes. My brain freezes sometimes. Pharisees. Thank you, Lord. It's right up here, Pharisees. He's... Uh, being questioned by the Pharisees, and they don't like his answers. So what do they do? Verse 18, But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind, and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye, shall, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind blind. Verse 21, but by what means he now seeth we know not, or who hath opened his eyes we know not. He is of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. Now why did they say that? Go on to verse 22, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogues. People are part of their cult following with these false gospels of repentance doesn't mean that you have to have sorrow for sinning against God. In fact, repentance just is going from unbelief to belief. Well, if it's just going from unbelief, there is no repentance. It's just belief. There's no confessing. There's no asking God to save you. All this stuff. What is it? They're part of their little group and they have so much fear of getting kicked out of their group and they love the praise of men, the men of that group. They don't want to get truly saved. They don't want to be truly born again. Okay. That's what's going on. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whoso shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. Okay. For I have come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. When you truly repent and believe, and you get to the part where you confess it to the Lord in prayer and in your heart, and you ask God to save you, people don't want to do that. Why? Because of what we just read right there. I, I got to get along with, I, I, what is my family going to think? What are my friends going to think? Co-workers. The little group I'm a part of. And a lot of false religions like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and Catholics, uh, the Jews, or yeah, the Jews, uh, when someone gets saved out of those religions, how do you think they get treated? That right there, fear. The reason people don't want to confess is because of fear. And they want to get the praise of men. Now, here's the thing though. Okay? In the end, guess what's going to happen? People, I'm not going to confess. I don't think confession is part of salvation. I don't have to confess. What's going to happen in the end, brothers and sisters in Christ? Philippians 2.9. I think you guys know where I'm going with this one. Philippians 2.9. I'm not going to confess. Uh, 
Philippians 2 9. Wherefore, am I making sure? Yep. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, heaven and hell, and things under the earth, I'm sorry, under the earth, hell. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is, capital L, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There's going to come a time everybody is going to be confessing Jesus Christ is the capital L, Lord. There's no getting around it. You can, re you can refuse to confess it now, refuse to confess it. I'm not confessing, I'm not confessing. But you will be. Everyone will be. Um, now, the next part we're going to talk about is if you ask, is it not a gift? That's something that people come at you with. If you ask, it's not a gift. If you ask God to save you, it's not a gift. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourself, it is a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you ask, it's works, it's not a gift. Okay. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a gift. I'm not denying that. Right? Nobody that believes, a King James Bible believing, God-fearing man and woman that preaches repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, they don't believe that it's not a gift. We do believe it's a gift. The Bible says it's a gift. I read uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 where it says it's a gift. And I love reading 10 because... The faith alone people hate the, hate chapter 10, uh, verse 10. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Change life after salvation. But John 4, 7. Okay, the Brother in Christ wrote, wrote a good book, book Brother JT. Uh, I have a book. Um, gosh, my, my shelf is way over there. Um, uh, give me a second. It'll take a couple seconds. Just give me a second. The Romans 10 Controversy. Uh, Jacob M. Thomas. I did a book review on this. You can look on my channel and everything. But Jacob Thomas taught me something. The Holy Spirit in him bear witness with my Holy Spirit. And I was like, this is amazing. I've always said, I did a, a video, um, Is God's Grace a Gift? I wish that I knew this. God will show you things at different times. But John chapter 4, verse 7. John chapter 4, verse 7. Four, verse 7. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. I think I didn't set the camera back right, but give me, uh, Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Right there, what did he just say? If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee eternal life. That's the gift. And he's saying, if you would have asked me, I'd have given you that gift. And these people out there, oh, you don't ask. You don't ask. What is this? People don't want the real Jesus Christ. They don't want to give up their sin. We've talked about this in the true biblical repentance. Worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. People love their worldly sorrow. They love their sin. They don't want to give it up. They'll do anything they can to attack true biblical salvation. Now, one last thing that we want to hit real quick is... All, let's see... How do I, I kind of said this wrong. There's people that hit us think, thinking that we don't believe that blood's important. We do believe the blood is important. But what happens is what we do is we tell people that if all you do is confess 
the blood, it's just the blood, it's just the blood. That's all that's important is the blood. That's false. That's 100% false. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. What's happening in Corinthians? People are coming through and teaching a false gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. The death, burial, and resurrection is not that important. And this is a good, good example of why Paul said that they're believing in vain in 1 Corinthians um, 1 through 4. They're believing in a false Jesus. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain? Or preaching vain? And your faith is also vain? Because they're believing in Jesus that's not God if he didn't raise from the dead. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. Yea, and we are found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. In other words, he's saying we're considered liars because we preach he raised from the dead. Someone's coming along saying, no, Jesus didn't raise from the dead. Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Why is it so important, the death, burial, and resurrection? If all Jesus did was bleed and he died an old man, it can do nothing for you. If all Jesus did was die on the cross, he bled and died, and it's important, and he just died, never was raised from the dead, then he's not God. And it wasn't God's blood that was shed on Calvary, therefore his blood can do nothing, ye are still in your sins. Ye are yet in your sins. And if you die in your sins, you go to hell. Do we deny the blood that was spilled on Jesus on that was spilled on the cross? No. It's God's blood. But what we're against is when people try to downplay or take out the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection proved that Jesus is God and that it's God's blood that was shed on Calvary. That's why it's so important. I wanted to throw that in there. We do confess and we do believe that the blood that was shed on the cross can wash your sins away. But why do we believe that? Because Jesus died for our sins and that he rose again the third day, proving that he is God and he overcome the law of sin and death that we just talked about. So that'll be the study for Salvation for Lost Sinners Prayer. So thank you for following along and keeping up with me. I'm sorry for that last little bit of jumbling the camera around. I still like this book. It's a good book. I learned some things from this book and I would get it. But I just thought that was amazing. That's the best example I've ever come across through a brother in Christ showing me in the scriptures that Jesus himself, so when someone tells you about asking, Oh, asking is a work. Uh, no, it isn't. You just called Jesus a liar. He said it's a gift and you can ask for a gift. If you ask for a gift, it's, it's not a gift anymore. You just called Jesus a liar. I just thought that was amazing. I still do. I love God's word. So, um, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Real quick. I was going to say thank you for watching. I want to throw it in here. I'm going to start throwing in videos. I have a P.O. box. Okay? It'll be down in the comment section. It's on the About page. Um, if you guys want to write me, I'd ap appreciate it. I'd love encouragement, prayer requests. I know we got emails, but I'm trying to do some things old school, doing letters, be able to sit out on the deck. Um, it's been a month. haven't got anything from anybody. That's fine. But I just need to keep throwing it out there so you brothers and sisters in Christ know that I have a P.O. box now. You guys can write me. Um, you can make requests if you need something. Like I said, let me know. I can send Bibles to people. I can, I, I'd usually buy them and then send them, like order them online and have them mailed to you direct. But just, you know, send me an email. Or not email. Send me a letter. It'd be nice to try to do some letters. You know, go back to the old pass. So now I'm going to say thank you for watching.